It is such a pleasure to be the acting director of BCRW, and it's a big job because Janet Jacobson is such a fabulous full-time regular coming back soon director of the BCRW. <laughs> and so it's just, it's wonderful to be able to work with her and the wonderful staff at the center. So it's really been a pleasure thus far. And it's wonderful to see all these people here in the event oval. Um, and it's a particular pleasure that I am able to uh, introduce our first keynote speaker for this conference, Sonia Alvarez. Sonia Alvarez is the Leonard J. Horwitz Professor of Latin American Politics and Studies and the Director of the Center for Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino Studies at University of Massachusetts Amherst. She was educated at Smith College, another women's college, um, where she got her undergraduate degree in Government and Latin American Studies and then her PhD from Yale University in Political Science. Before she went to the University of Massachusetts about six years ago, she taught for nearly 20 years at the University of California at Santa Cruz. She is an extremely accomplished scholar and activist. She is the author of a book entitled Engendering Democracy in Brazil, Women's Movements in Transition Politics, which was published by Princeton University Press in 1990. And she's currently working on a book that I can't wait to read, which is entitled Feminism in Movement, Cultural Politics, Policy Advocacy, and Transnational Activism in Latin America, which is under contract with Duke University Press. She's the editor and co-editor of several books and special issues of uh, academic journals, including the forthcoming volume Translocalities, Translocalidades, Feminist Politics of Translation in uh, the Latin Americas, also to be published by Duke. She's written literally dozens of articles in refereed journals and chapters in edited books, articles and chapters written originally in English, Spanish, and Portuguese, and many of them have subsequently themselves been translated variously into German, English, and Spanish. So translation, it's clear, is not only the object of theoretical scrutiny in her work, but also a living part of her scholarly life. Her scholarly life is also interwoven with activism um, at a transnational level. She was Fulbright visiting professor in the Department of Political Science and the Interdisciplinary Graduate Program in Social Sciences at the State University of Campinas in Sao Paulo, Brazil in 19, 1992, and visiting scholar at the Center for Philosophy and Human Sciences at the Federal University of Santa Catarina, also in Brazil in 1999 and 2000. Between 1993 and 96, she coordinated the Rights and Social Justice Program for the Brazil Office of the Ford Foundation. She has an extremely long list of other professional accomplishments, including service on national boards, advisory panels, and professional associations, including serving for 18 months as the president of LASA, the Latin American Studies Association, which is the principal professional organization for scholars of, uh, of Latin America and the Caribbean. She also has long-standing activist commitments to feminist, anti-racist, and ultra-globalist movements, and in a tradition consonant with the work that we are celebrating here at this conference, Alvarez has a long history of blending activism and scholarship. Indeed, she's rather a walking example of the scholar and the feminist. Her current research focuses on place-based perspectives on global social movements, the articulation of race and anti-racist politics among feminists and other progressive social movements in Brazil and other Latin American settings, and the so-called side-streaming of feminist discourses and practices onto parallel social movement, civil society spaces, like grassroots women's organizations, the World Social Forum, and other popular movements. It's a real privilege and honor to welcome Professor Sonia Alvarez, a quintessential scholar and feminist, to Barnard College and to this conference celebrating 40 years of scholarship and feminism at the Barnard Center for Research on Women. Please join me in welcoming Sonia Alvarez, who will deliver our first keynote address. Thank you all for coming out this morning, and uh, thank you, Elizabeth and Janet, and everyone who contributed to organizing this wonderful uh, conference, which I look forward to participating in for the next couple of days, and I'm thrilled to have occasion uh, to uh, commence. And I'm delighted to be here to commemorate 40 years 
of the Barnard Center for Research on Women's Leadership in the Field of Feminist Studies. Uh, and I'm particularly happy to join you all in celebrating its pathbreaking work in bridging activism and the academy. I'm especially uh, pleased to be here today because I actually cut one of my earliest political wisdom teeth at a Scholar in the Feminist uh, conference, the famous sex conference, uh, perhaps, which was perhaps the first space where I was able to articulate my multiple positionalities as scholar, activist, Cuban immigrant, Latina, woman of color, and budding baby dyke. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I uh, also have attended and or presented at several other center events over the years. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to present something that, uh, for those of you who know some of my work, may seem a bit odd. It's a very different sort of text than my usual sort of post-political science cum wannabe anthropologist me. Um, and I'm going to present actually uh, the introduction from a forthcoming co-edited anthology uh, that, um, uh, that Elizabeth mentioned, uh, Translocal Translocalities, Translocalidades, Feminist Politics of Translation in the Latina Americas. Um, I'll give you just a little bit of background on that project before I move to the introduction. Uh, it's a project in a forthcoming book. First of all, it's very much a political as well as intellectual project, which is uh, the reason I decided it would be an appropriate thing for, for, to open this conference is that it's very much in the spirit of Scholar and the Feminist and that it conjoins political and intellectual theoretical preoccupations. And secondly, it's very much a collect collective collaborative uh, project of framework building and bridge building across a number of uh, theoretical uh, geographical and other many other kinds of borders as you'll see um, my co-editors it's a it's a large team of people my co-editors include Claudia de Lima Costa uh, Veronica Feliu Rebecca Hester Norma Klein uh, Millie Thayer and Cruz uh, Caridad Bueno there's a total of 23 chapters and 24 contributors from across the Americas one of my co-editors Claudia de Lima Costa is here Today, and actually, and so is one of our um, contributors from Mexico, Marisa, where are you? Marisa Velasegui Goitia, uh, who will be presenting tomorrow. Um, and anyway, I want to, one of the things to emphasize is that this process has been a very, um, very much an ongoing uh, process. A lot of edited collections these days are put together after a one or two day conference. Uh, ours has been the cultivated and now matured fruit of a multi-year collaborative process that stretched across a number of countries, institutions, disciplines, and generations, and uh, has involved Latin American, Latin Americanist, and Latina feminist scholars from both the North and South of the Americas. Uh, the editors and many of the contributors form part of a greater San Francisco Bay Area research group that met at the University of California at Santa Cruz uh, for over a number of years under the auspices of the Chicano Latino Research Center. Uh, most others also participated at one point or another in one of the several sessions on travels and translations of feminist theories in the Americas that we organized uh, for several meetings of the Latin American Studies Association, starting, I think, the first one was in 2000, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and or in one of several conferences and seminars we've held on the topic at Santa Cruz, at the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil, and most recently at UMass Amherst. Our anthology, I think, transgresses disciplinary boundaries as shamelessly and energetically as it does geopolitical ones. Uh, the authors are based in a variety of disciplines from media studies to literature to Chicana, Chicano studies to political science and beyond. Uh, most chapters span a range of disciplinary knowledges and theoretical perspectives uh, in, in a single um, piece, essay. Uh, moreover, our contributors have been engaged in a stained dialogue which is another rare thing for anthologies, and, that the, and so that the essays in the book are in explicit conversation with one another. Uh, that conversation is intergenerational as well as interethnic, international, and interdisciplinary, um, and has required all of us to interrogate some of our most dearly and steadfastly held assumptions, and has inspired many of us to learn to read and to translate in new ways. Um, the intro and all the chapters are undergoing one final round of revisions this fall and will go into production hopefully early next year. 
Um, this is the first public presentation of the full draft of the introduction. Uh, it, I, my intent is to whet your appetite for the book. I have brought, I, there won't be enough, but you can share with your neighbor. Um, if somebody could help me, um, should be the definitive table of contents. There may be some shifts in the orderings and whatnot, but I'm giving it to you because I'm about to um, read from the introduction because in it I invoke, if not channel, 24 different voices, uh, and um, so it's best to read from it. Uh, and I'll do, try to do so as animatedly as possible, but you can, as I especially make reference to different chapters, you can uh, follow um, what the titles are and whatnot in the book. Okay? So, um, so this is from the first introduction. There's a second introduction to the book um, that's written by Claudia that I will make reference to as well in this. Um, this book explores how feminist discourses and practices travel across a variety of sites and directionalities to become interpretive paradigms to read, write issues of class, gender, race, sexuality, migration, health, social movements, development, citizenship, politics, and the circulation of identities and texts. The notion of translation is deployed figuratively uh, to emphasize the ways in which these travels are politically embedded within larger questions of globalization and involve exchanges across diverse localities, especially between and among women in Latin America and Latinas in the United States. The contributors, who include authors from Argentina, Brazil, Bolivia, Chile, and Mexico, as well as East and West Coast-based Latinas of Cuban, Puerto Rican, Mexican, Chilean, Peruvian, and Dominican descent, uh, and other U.S. women of color and allies, enact a politics of translation by unabashedly trafficking in feminist theories and practices across geopolitical, disciplinary, and other borders, bringing insights from Latina, women of color, post-colonial feminisms in the north of the Americas to bear on our analyses of theories, practices, cultures, and politics in the south, and vice versa. Translation is politically and theoretically indispensable to forging feminist pro-social justice, anti-racist, post-colonial, decolonial, and anti-imperial political alliances and epistemologies because the Latina Americas, as a trans-border cultural formation rather than a territorially delimited one, must be understood as translocal in a dual sense. The first sense we deploy, that of translocation, builds on but moves beyond U.S. third world feminist conceptions of the politics of location. Because a feminist politics of location involves a temporality of struggle, not a fixed position, as Claudia de Lima Costa argues in a second introductory essay to the volume, we must be attentive to the social and power relations that produce location and situated knowledges. Yet as Agustin Laumontes suggests, Latinas, Latinos, and Afro-Latinos, and Latinas in particular, are best conceptualized as translocal subjects. In his reading, the politics of location as developed by U.S. women of color feminisms relates to the multiple mediations, gender, race, class, etc., that constitute the self to diverse modes of domination, capitalism, patriarchy, racism, imperialism, and to distinct yet intertwined um, social struggles and movements. The notion of translocation takes us a step further, linking geographies of power at various scales with subject positions, gender, sexual, ethno-racial, et cetera, that constitute the self. So here, we wish uh, to extend this conception of translocation to encompass not just U.S. Latinos, Latinas, but to all of the Latina Americas. A hemispheric politics of translocation would be attentive to the heterogeneity of Latinidades within and within and among, within the U.S., I'm sorry, and within and among Latin American and Caribbean peoples, as well as to the diverse positionalities that shape Latino, Latina American lives across multiple borders. In the 21st century, political borders cannot contain cultural ones, just as within political borders, different nations, cultures, and languages cannot be suppressed in the name of the national, uh, understood as a monolithic unity, as Norma Klon argues in her chapter. Many sorts of Latinoamericanidades, Afro, queer, indigenous, feminist, and so on, are today constructed through processes of translocation. 
Latinidad in the South, North, and Caribbean middle of the Americas then is always already constituted out of the intersections of the intensified cross-border transcultural and translocal flows that characterize contemporary transmigration throughout the hemisphere, from La Paz to Buenos Aires to Chicago and back again. As Teresa Carrillo's contribution to this volume makes poignantly clear, um, many such crossings are emotionally, materially, and physically costly, often dangerous, and increasingly perilous. Yet cross-border passages also, also always reposition and transform subjectivities and worldviews. Rather than imagining and assimilating, moreover, many people in the Latin Americas increasingly move back and forth uh, between localities, between historically situated and culturally specific, though increasingly porous places, across multiple borders, and not just between nations, as implied in the term transnational migration, for instance. We therefore deploy the notion translocal in a second sense, which we will call no, translocalities or translocalidades, precisely to capture these multidirectional crossings and movements. Many, if not all, of the contributors to this anthology regularly transit across an array of intimate, familial, personal, libidinal, consumer, financial, cultural, political, and labor circuits in and through different locales of the Latin Americas and beyond. Our feminism, as Marga Young suggests in her contribution, is a multi-located practice. Like traveling theories and today's transmigrants, our own crossings theoretical, political, personal, and intimate are heavily patrolled and often constrained or obstructed by various kinds of gatekeepers. Crucially for the politics of translation, our multiple locations or subject positions shift, often quite dramatically, as we move or travel across spatiotemporal localities. Our subjectivities are at once place-based and mis- or displaced. Uh, whereas, for instance, I'm an ethnicized Cuban-American in South Florida and a racialized Latina in New England, whenever I deplane in Sao Paulo, Brazil, I instantly become white. <laughs> but I necessarily embody my provisional whiteness uncomfortably, as I'm all too painfully aware of the injuries inflicted by racism in both the North and the South of the Americas. Though less flexible for the darkest bodies because of the fact of blackness, as Fanon rightly insisted, race can be a mobile, sig mobile signifier across borders. Race is not a fixed marker of identity, but one that varies as people inhabit particular spaces, as Brazilian anthropologist Susana Maia's contribution makes clear. Indeed, as Chilean emigre Veronica Feliu reminds us, our translocalized understandings of race often force us to deal with our own ghosts our own repressed memories, and finally, as Sheree Moraga said more than 20 years ago, with that racism we have internalized, the one we aimed at ourselves. Because our transit across multiple boundaries disrupts the prevailing common sense in, the many, in, in many of the localities through which we move in ways that sometimes makes us seem outright mad, in a double sense, we early on adopted the nickname translocas, <laughs> for our cross-disciplinary, cross-border research group of Latina, Latin Americanist feminists who brought this, collect this edited collection into being. Uh, like the Afro-Chilean vocalist and composer Moyene Valdez, whose work is analyzed here by Macarena Gomez Barris, our politics and theorizing seek to interrupt the hegemonic drone of economic neoliberalism, heteronormative patriarchal racisms, and racist sexisms across the Latino Americas. We deploy the metaphor translocas to capture both the movements of bodies, texts, capital, and theories in between North-South, and to reflect the mobile epistemologies they inspire in growing numbers of subjects in contemporary times. The metaphor is deployed in, in, with a double meaning, both women trans dislocated in a physical sense and the resulting conceptual madness linked to attempts to understand unfamiliar scenarios with familiar categories, women and categories out of place. With this book, we wish to propose Translocas as both a political project 
and an episteme for apprehending and negotiating the globalized Americas, one that can potentially be embraced widely across the hemisphere and beyond. The increased mobility and displacement of peoples, their cultures, and languages, as Norma Klan notes in her chapter, are deconstructing conceptual mappings of north to south, south to north roots, let alone their translations and reception. Indeed, with the intensification of trans migration, growing numbers of Latinas, Latinos, and Latin Americans today embody Sh uh, similar shifting, similarly shifting registers, positionalities, and epistemes due to their int our intermittent movement in and across diverse localities in the North and South of the Americas. Growing numbers of folks are, in effect, becoming translocas, translocos. We are expanding exponentially. Translocas in the Americas and other globalized places defy the us and them uh, paradigm that stems from modernist colonial modes of description and representation because we are simultaneously and intermittently self and other, if you will. As Karina Cespedes suggests, many in the Latin Americas are world travelers as a matter of necessity and survival. Translocas travels and translation efforts are also driven by affect, passion, solidarity, interpersonal and political connectedness. What's more, we travel across multiple worlds within ourselves. Uh, rather than Du Bois's double consciousness, our translocalities enable a multiple, intersectional, multi-sided consciousness, a translocated version of Chela Sandoval's differential or oppositional consciousness. Many of us become double insiders, as Kirang Asher refers to her own translocation as a South Asian feminist researching and working with Afro-Colombian women. As Simone Schmidt remind, uh, maintains, displacement is altogether too familiar to many subjects in late modern times, and the feeling of dislocation, or in this case, translocality, often leaves us, as Stuart Hall suggests, with the sensation that we are not at home any place. She proposes that it may be more appropriate to think of coming home as impossible, because home no longer exists. The road leaving home is one of no return. Perhaps like Ansaldua, who Schmidt uh, reminds us claimed she carried her home on um, her back like a turtle, translocas, translocas bear our multiple localities on ours as well. Our di dislocations across a variety of here's and there's, our travels to and from different contexts of knowledge production and reception, as the Limacosa suggests, afford translocas certain types of analytical baggage that can alter one's perceptions of subalternity, privilege, intellectual work, and feminism. Translocalities fuel endless epistemic traveling as well. As Feliu tells us, I find myself being here, talking about there, thinking there with my words here, uncovering here what is hidden there, problematizing there what could be too simple here. Together with contributor Esther Shapiro, many of us strive to learn from our shifting relocations as cultural outsiders and ethnocentric U.S. feminist organizations, as women in, as women in sexist Latino community-based organizations, as women of the third world whose Spanish is too Caribbean and primitive for European sensibilities, and as Latina gringas whose Spanglish marks us as undereducated in our nation of origin, language, culture, and politics. Because of our manifold circuits, travels, and misdisplacements, translocas are more than diasporic subjects. We are necessarily translators. For starters, we have to translate ourselves across our differing locales of attachment and commitment. Indeed, for those of us who are US-based, Translation is an untiring game, a way of life, a strategy of survival in the North. Uh, for many of us who were born in the US or who immigrated as children with parents who spoke no English, translation starts practically in infancy, as Isabel Espinal reminds us in her chapter. Translocas straddle and transform languages and cultures as neither our mother tongue nor our other languages is or language is either really foreign or our own, as Espinal further notes. Like Donna K. Rushkin, whose The Bridge Poem opens this bridge called My Back, writings by radical women of color, we all do more translating 
than the goddamn UN. <laughs> Ruskin complained of being tired of translating, and I quote from her poem, I've had enough. I'm sick of seeing and touching both sides of things, sick of being the damn bridge for everybody. Nobody can talk to anybody without me, right? I explain my mother to my father, my father to my little sister, my little sister to my brother, my brother to the white feminist, the white feminist to the black church folks, the black church folks to the ex-hippies, the ex-hippies to the black separatists, and the black separatists to the artists, and the artists to my friend's parents. <laughs> then I have to explain myself to everybody. I was drawn to revisit Rushkin's poem in the process of writing this introduction and readily came up with a personalized trans locas adaptation. I sometimes grow weary of seeing and touching multiple sides of things. I explain the Americanos to the Cubans, the Cubans to the Brazilians, the racist Brazilians and Cubans and other Latin Americans to the U.S. women of color feminists, the U.S. women of color feminists to Latino men, the Latino men to the U.S. white feminists, the U.S. white feminists to the Latina, Latin American black feminists and to the Latin American white feminists who don't identify as white, the Latin American <laughs> white feminists to queer U.S. Latinas, the queer U.S. Latinas to my mother's Cuban American friends, then I try to explain myself to everybody. <laughs> as, as I'm still a little embarrassed when I read that. This, <laughs> so it's just you know, very far from my Yale PhD in political science. Um, anyway, uh, which is a good thing. As as, as Espinal laments, um, this kind of multi-directional translating can simply become tedious, and we become hartos of this role. Translocas like Espinal and I cannot afford to tire of translation, however, in the face of the increasing entrapment of local cultures and knowledge and the global flows of capital and commodities, as many of our contributors insist, there's a growing need for feminists to engage in productive dialogue and negotiations across multiple geopolitical and theoretical borders. As Millie Thayer suggests in her contribution, the stakes in feminist translations are high. Translations themselves, she maintains, are objects of struggle, and translation, or its refusal, is a strategic political act in the hands of social movements, whether it involves the sharing of knowledge to foster an alliance or the interruption of a dominant discourse to defend autonomy. If women's movements in the Latina Americas and elsewhere in the Global South share a common context of struggle, as Thayer contends, then their conflicts with the scattered hegemonies represented by states, development industries, global capital, religious fundamentalisms, and market relations create powerful, even if only partially overlapping, interests and identities that make the project of translation among them both possible and all the more pressing. Pasha Bueno Hansen argues that cultural translation can facilitate dialogue between ostensibly incompatible political positions in different locations through a dynamic and necessarily incomplete process of mediation across discursive political, linguistic, and geographic borders and power asymmetries. Theorizing the practice of what she dubs translinguas, Meili Blackwell further proposes that translocal translation is a key step in coalition building, especially critical for actors who are multiply marginalized in their national context, creating linkages with social actors across locales in, in order to build new affiliations, solidarities, and movements. We all need to devise, devise better bridging epistemologies so as to confront this mis the mistranslations, or bad translations, if you will, that have fueled misunderstandings and obstructed feminist alliances, even among women who share the same languages and cultures, like US-based Latinas and Latin Americans. As Delima Costa argues pointedly, the intersections between Latina and Latin American feminisms, that, uh, in, in the interactions between Latina and Latin American feminisms, the travels of discourses and practices encounter formidable roadblocks and migratory checkpoints. She recounts our Locas group's incessant wrestling and frustration with, on the one hand, the untranslatability of the concept women of color, uh, whether as a political project or as an identity category, when carried to other topographies, and on the other, with the obliteration of questions of sexuality, race, and class in the production of a universal subject of Latin American feminism, self-referential self and exclusive of perspectives that question the very notion of women as a collective identity until recent years. 
itself a product of the operations of what Miyang calls hegemonic feminism in the North within the South of the Americas. As chapters that deal extensively with Afro-Latin American women's movements and feminisms, indigenous women, and Latina U.S. women of color coalitional politics make patently evident, Latina America is made up of multiple and multidirectional and often overlapping intertwined diasporas. Latina, Latino people of color theorists and activists, especially anti-racist, feminist, indigenous, and um, Afro-Latino rights advocates, therefore are particularly well translocated uh, to help foster the spread of bridging identities and epistemologies throughout the Americas. Laumontes and Bugs maintain, for instance, that Afro-Latina difference can be a crucial component uh, of a coalitional political community and a significant element within fields of intellectual production and critique. As Shapiro suggests, U.S. Latina immigrants also can make, a dis can, can make distinctive contributions in translating feminist activisms across U.S. divides of race, ethnicity, class, and educational status while remaining associated with global third world feminisms through nation of origin connections. Translocas are also more than world traveling translators. We are cultural, political, theoretical mediators. We are agents of transculturation. As a counterpoint to assimilationist theories of culturation, Fernando Ortiz's notion of transculturation necessarily involves the loss or uprooting of a previous culture, which could be defined as deculturation, and carries the idea of a consequent creation of a new cultural phenomenon. As de Lima Cosa suggests is the case with traveling theories and other cross-border flows, translocal feminism at least potentially disfigures, deforms, and transforms the culture and or discipline that receives it. Translocas interrogate and thereby destabilize received meanings of race, class, sexualities, genders, and other locational politics on all sides of compound borders as these, shift, as these meanings shift as we move across diverse localities. Bodies and desires are reproduced and transformed through processes of translocal translation as several contributions make clear. Like the Brazilian erotic dancers analyzed by Susana Maia and the women of Fortaleza, Brazil, and gay Mexican men who engage in sex tourism, translocas refashion new racial and sexual selves as we cross multiple borders. Our remittances, of which women are the most faithful center, senders, as Carrillo notes in her chapter, are sociocultural and political as well as material. A translocas conception of transculturation, understood as promoting intracultural as well as cross-cultural processes of multidirectional transformation and multi-level processes of deculturation, uh, deculturation and cultural refoundation, also aims to engage productively with contemporary theorizing on the coloniality of power. As Norma Klan proposes in her contribution to better understand the coloniality of power, one must begin to comprehend the unequal traveling and translation of feminist practices, theories, and texts, and their reception. Citing Boaventura de Souza Santos, Schmidt uh, similarly insists that post-colonial decolonial theory requires a dense articulation with the question of sexual discrimination and feminism in order to reveal the sexist norms of sexuality that tend to lay a white man down on a bed with a, white, with a black woman rather than a white woman and a black man. Though a translocal translational politics arguably is crucial to the decolonial turn, the, uh, the failure to engage feminist theory can result in homogenizing views of subaltern cultures that ignore or underplay sexual, gendered, racialized age, class, and other differences in power relations that sustain hierarchies even among or within uh, decolonial communities, decolonial subjects like indigenous and Afro-descendant peoples. Lamontes and Bugs nonetheless insist that de a decolonial politics of translocation is essential to dismantling hierarchies of rule and the colonial legacies of race, gender, class, sexuality, and nation that have shaped the lives, structural predicaments, and identities of women of color and of Afro-America. Blackwell shows, moreover, that a decolonial third world imaginary was at the core of early women of color organizing in the U.S. as it is today among many indigenous and anti-racist activists in the Latin American region. 
In her post-colonial reading of black women's struggles in Colombia, Asher further notes that post-colonial, decolonial politics and epistemes are crucial to challenging the binaries, theory versus practice, power versus resistance, discourse versus materiality, victims versus guardians, and so on, that plague and limit so much thinking in the field of third world women, gender, and development, arguing cogently that, like colonial discourses, such binaries occlude the complex, contradictory, incomplete, and power-laden processes and practices against and within which women emerge and act. Um, so that's a sort of overview of the framework um, that, that, um, that comes out of thinking about the, the 21 chapters together. I now want to tell you a little bit, um, the, the introduction proceeds to tell you uh, a bit about the book chapters themselves, and you can follow along in the table of contents that I distributed if you wish. The book chapters are grouped into five parts. Uh, the first, Introductions to the Feminist Politics of Translation, offers overviews of the collective intellectual and political processes that inform this book and features Claudia uh, Dilimacosa's essay, Lost and Found in Translation, Feminism in Hemispheric Dialogues, which served as kind of a concept paper that provided the theoretical backdrop for our collective project. The chapter provides an overview of feminist and other translation theorists' reflections on the travels and translations of feminist theories in the Americas. Um, drawing on our Translocas group's collective theoretical and political illuminations, up until that point, it explores issues concerning feminism, translation, and transnationalism, translocalities. Um, I'm gonna do some editing in the interest of time here as I move along. Uh, part two of the book, mobilizations, in case you, know, you remember this verbatim and you read the introduction and you find that I left out parts. Um, <laughs> Part two of the book, Mobilizations, Mobilizing Theories, Texts, Images, presents essays centered on how actual texts, theories, authors, and theorists have traveled and been translated, and how the mobilization of such translation affects the translocal making of feminist meanings in the Americans. Mexican cultural critic Marisa de las, Marisa de, Marisa de las de Goitia opens the section with a parallel reading of a triangle of authors, Gloria Saldúa, Subcomandante Marcos, and Rosario Castellanos. Um, Advocating a pedagogy of the double, she proposes a politics of reading of border thinkers that seeks to find and represents that which has been expelled, lost from national borders through the marginalization of national subjects categorized as residual. She pairs or doubles, juxtaposes Gueras and Prietas, white upper, middle, up, upper class Castellanos on the one hand and the Mestiza Brown Indian-like poor Ansaldúa and Marcos on the other to evoke a binary that she argues is constitutive of Mexican society as a whole. Velasegui Goitia's essay illustrates the powerful political and epistemological possibilities opened up when trans, uh, translocal readings disrupt the one-way transfer of the negative to the other to foster a two-way circulation of significance north-south, US and Mexico, canonical and non-canonical writers, originals and copies from above and from below. Chapters by Chicana critic Norma Klan and Bolivian liter literary theorist Ana Rebeca Prada further reveal the transgressive potential of translocated readings and pedagogies, proposing provocative strategies for reading across multiple borders. Klan offers an exacting analysis of women's writing in, Latin in the Latino Americas since the 1970s, illustrating how it has been a site actively marked by gender but where questions of class, ethnicity, sexuality, nation, and generation have been inexorably present. Uh, she insists these writings constitute poetic political interventions uh, that are also aesthetic ethical ones. Similarly concerned with mapping the travels of feminist theories in the Latin Americas, Prada explores the question of whether Ansaldúa is translatable in Bolivia. It's a very interesting question and in how she pursues it is as well. Affecting what we would call a um, a transgressively faithless appropriation, Prada, like Klan and Belasegui Goitia, seek to open new scenarios of conversation and propose new horizons for dialogue across the Latino Americas by facilitating an unprecedented conversation between radical feminist queer mestizas and indigenous feminists across Texas and La Paz, Bolivia. 
Such translocal reappropriations of traveling theories, she argues, enable us to reimagine how feminist discourses and practices, as well as text, uh, might be able to travel north, south, uh, south, north. Uh, noting that the history of feminism in Brazil was written in painful struggles in which class and race were necessarily articulated with gender, even before such an articulation prevailed in the agendas of metropolitan feminisms, Brazilian literary critic Simone Schmidt, um, her uh, contribution explores the tense and poorly resolved legacy of slavocratic patriarchy and its consequences in terms of racial, class, sexual, and gendered inequalities and violence. The fruit of that violence, she pointedly notes, is the corpo mestizo, the racially mixed body, which constitutes a veritable battleground upon which the multiple inherent contradictions of race and racism in the lusophone post-colonial world unfold. Um, Similarly seeking, uh, working to trans, no, similarly seeking to interpret Eurocentric translation theories uh, so as to better apprehend the position of an immigrant Dominican woman from New York translating the Spanish language poems of Irene Santos, another Dominican New York woman, Espinal offers a poignant and insightful discussion of how and why translation for both she and Santos is a matter of politics and an act of faith. The chapters in part three, mediations, uh, national and transnational identities and circuits turns to considerations of the venues, circuits, institutions, agents, and theory brokers that facilitate or obstruct the movements and mobilizations of specific feminist discourses and practices, privileging some while silencing others. Uh, Brazilian feminist theorist Lima Costa's contribution to this section of the book explores how Brazil's premier feminist studies journal, Revista Estudos Feministas, has been a key component of the material apparatus which organizes the translation, publication, and circulation of feminist theories. She maintains that the Revista, in fact, had a constitutive role in the field it claims only to represent, and that its editors and editorial committees, as well as the agendas of the journal's funders, exert the function of gatekeepers of the feminist academic community, uh, policing the many local appropriations translations of, of, um, of um, metropolitan theories. The journal has produced a gender studies canon that affords easier transit and greater visibility to authors and theories closest to international circuits of academic prestige uh, and situated at privileged racial, geographical, Rio, Sao Paulo, and class sites. Uh, to promote more symmetry in the global flows of feminist theory, she contends academic feminist journals must work to establish epistemological counter canons uh, and engage in practices of translations that translate with a vengeance. Mexican anthropologist Margaret Millán also focuses on three feminist magazines, Fem, Debate Feminista, and La Correa Feminista, uh, as venues that control the flux of feminist discourses and practices, particularly those concerning race, ethnicity, and indigeneity. Closely examining the translational politics of those publications, the theories and authors they translate, and the ways they align with local political contests, context, she argues that feminist journals are particularly relevant in shaping communication between different kinds of practices and are privileged places from which to understand the relationship between feminist theory, activism, and national politics. I think uh, feminist research centers, for that matter, are similarly privileged sites in that sense, I would think, as are centers for Latin American, Caribbean, Latino studies that I run and whatnot in terms of who circulates, what circulates, and, and what, gets to be, what gets to be heard. Um, two Chapters that follow by political scientists Hester and Asher explore the lives of indigenous Mexican immigrant women in the U.S. and Afro-Colombian women in the Chocó Valley um, and, um, and how they are represented by health promotion and development discourses re respectively. Uh, examining how Mixteca and Triqui women translate dominant medical and health care models and local patriarchies in caring for themselves and their families, Hester analyzes how indigenous migrant women's bodies are written by and through the forces they engage with in their daily lives while showing how they also become agents in that writing. Um, I'm, I'm doing editing as we go along. Asher similarly warns that dominant discourses of women in development fail to appreciate the contradictions and complexities of Afro-Colombian women's experiences. Analyzing the text, interviews, statements, poetry, songs, stories of Matamba y Gausa, a network of black women in the Cauca region of Colombia, she argues that gender experts 
uh, mistranslate local women's engagements with development and the environment. As she suggests that, that post-colonial feminist approaches complicate our understanding of black women's activism, highlighting how they are shaped differently, unequally, and discursively, and can thereby contribute to developing more nuanced readings of Afro-descendant women's uh, texts in context. Uh, then we have a chapter by sociologist Macarena Gomez Barriz, a second generation Chilean American, who examines how feminist and anti-racist discourses and practices flow through music and performance, uh, explore music as translation in the work of Afro-Chilean performer Moine Valdez. And I'm not, um, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm, I'm not, I'm not wanting to discriminate against any of my, all my wonderful 24 contributors here, but again, I'm wanting to move us through. Part four, migrations disrupting borders, draws attention to translocalities and translations enacted in the movement of across gendered, sexualized, and class-based and racialized bodies and borders. Uh, Teresa Carrillo provides a richly detailed account of the growing feminization of migration and the increased reliance on migrant domestic service workers to meet the care deficit of the global north. Um, Veronica Feliu's contribution demonstrates that racialized patriarchal devaluation of domestic service workers respects no geopolitical boundaries and is amply evident in southern latitudes of the Americas as well, struggling to translate Chilean feminist silences surrounding the labor of women, that w women perform for other women. She undertakes a detailed analysis of Chilean domestic service work principally performed by indigenous Chileans uh, and Peruvian migrants. Three chapters in this part of the book uh, explore how women and men in the Latin Americas redefine and rearticulate their racial, class, and sexual subjectivities as they translate themselves in sexual erotic uh, encounters in and from new latitudes. Brazilian anthropologist Susana Maia examines how women who work as erotic dancers in New York City deploy racial categories such as morena uh, in order to articulate the tensions in their shifting identity as they move across nation states. Uh, she argues that using a language of racial mixture and mimetically incorporating icons of Brazilian sexuality and race are central to the dancer's sense of self and ways of experiencing the body, revealing how racial configurations are defined transnationally. In an equally rich ethnographic account of sex travels in Fortaleza, Brazil, Brazil-based Argentine anthropologist Adriana Pisitelli shows that local residents who work in sex tourism translate themselves to suit the sex traveler's expectations. Accommodating sex tourist desires for racialized, intense, tropical sexuality, local women seeking relationships with sex travelers embody and reconfigure sexualized notions about Brazil, performing the racialized identity allocated to them by foreigners. In an engaging and provocative analysis of life in the sexual borderlands, Chicano sociologist Leonel Cantu uh, sheds further light on how sexualities and racial subjectivities are transformed in and through translocal crossings and contacts, including those that occur uh, through tourism. And he explores how colonial desire and the Western queer imaginary represent Mexico as a place fixed in time where real men can be found. Finally, uh, movements Feminist, Social, Political, Postcolonial, the fifth and final part of the book offers a set of essays analyzing how and why particular theories and discourses do or do not translate in the political and cultural practices of Latin American, Latina and Latin American feminist movements. The section opens with an analysis of transborder multi-scalar flows across three movement formations, the indigenous women's movement, um, the lesbian feminist movement in Mexico and Chicana and women of color feminisms in the U.S. Uh, by Native American Thai uh, cultural theorist May Lee Blackwell. She introduces unaligned geographies of differences as a theoretical framework for analyzing the possibilities and challenges implicated in forging feminist co coalitions and movement building across borders. Um, Peruvian American political scientist Basha Bueno Hansen at once explores and facilitates a dialogue between movimientos de lesbiana feministas and queer women of color feminists in the Americas. Her analysis highlights how the meaning, uh, the meaning of the term queer, uh, as it travels across borders and through different movement spaces, is marked by power asymmetries that include accelerated transcultural flows, usage of international and regional forms and networks, and increased migration. Shapiro's chapter turns to a consideration of how traveling texts can both facilitate and obstruct cross-border coalitional politics, analyzing her own and other U.S. Latinas' accomplishments and disillusionments 
in translocating our bodies ourselves into nuestros cuerpos, nuestras vidas, a text deliberately designed to be read, interpreted, and used differently as it traveled. Um, through a translocal feminist reading of another widely circulated text, Ay Rigoberta Menchú, Chicana literary critic Vicky Bañales examines how indigenous women's revolutionary struggles openly defy and challenge dominant racialized gender and sexuality discourses that represent indigenous women as essentially passive, penetrable, and apolitical. Um, and she helps unearth and recuperate some of the text's buried gender truth effects, which have remained, for one reason or another, heavily lost in translation. Uh, further advancing keen theorizations of translocation and intertwined diasporas, Afro-Puerto Rican sociologist Agustin Lamontes and U.S. African-American feminist educator Mirangela Buggs explore similar questions through a discussion of U.S. Uh, women of color feminisms and Afro-Latino movements. Uh, and here I've mentioned their, their concepts of intertwined diasporas and other uh, notions earlier. And finally, examining the complex politics of translation in what she dubs transnational feminist uh, publics, feminist sociologist Millie Thayer caps off this final part of the book with a richly textured ethnographic analysis of the tortuous travels of feminist discourses and practices among women's movements in Recife and their allies and donors beyond Brazil examining the discursive circuits and flows between differentially translocated women in feminist counter publics, Thayer argues that the local movement, poli that local movement politics always entails many-fold and multi-directional translations among diverse women linked to publics organized around other markers such as race, class, local region, who speak distinctive dialects, even sometimes languages. So, to sum up, this collection aspires to take its place in a tradition of collaborative writing and anthologizing practices among Latina and women of color feminists in the U.S. It also represents an exercise in translocal knowledge production and collective collaborative framework building, which, as Escobar, as Arturo Escobar rightly insists, always pays off in terms of theoretical grounding, interpretive power, social relevance, and sense of politics. We've learned, in short, a great deal from one another's translocuras. Um, we originally emerged as a network of scholar activists articulated across the particular locations of southern Brazil, northern California, and later New England. What brought us together initially and subsequently brought others, Prada, Maya, Millán, Pisiteli, and Bela Seguigoitia, among them, uh, into our translocal circuit of the theorizing feminisms was the urgency of seeking new epistemes for reading culture, politics, gender, race, and so on that were not based on binary markers such as North and South. Indeed, a major goal of the anthology is to destabilize the North-South dichotomy and highlight how translocal subjects and theories are, from the, uh, theories are constituted in the spaces in between. Some of the contributors are from the South, speaking in the North about the South, or in the South, speaking about the North, or in the South, speaking about the South, or in the North, speaking from a translocal position that is neither North or South. This book thereby provides unprecedented insights into the travels and translations of feminist theories, practices, and discourses across the Americas, offering fresh perspectives on questions that are typically framed in terms of transnationalism and new ways of thinking about translocal connections among feminisms in the global north and within and across the global south. Our project aims to foster a renewed feminist and anti-racist episteme for reimagining and re-theorizing a revitalized Latino-Latina American feminist studies travestida or cross-dressed for the globalized transmigrant Americas of the 21st century. It also signals the possibilities of transformed U.S. American studies and a Latin American studies which would understand the Americas as a dynamic transborder, translocal cultural formation rather than a clearly delineated geopolitical space. We entreat activists, cultural workers, and knowledge producers inside and outside the academy to join us in translating and translocating hegemonic and subaltern discourses, policies, and practices, and in building alliances to forge a genuinely inclusive, socially, sexually, racially, economically, environmentally just, and feminist Latino Americas.